For most people, when you mention the word video games, the first thing they think of is PlayStation. For nearly 30 years, PlayStation consoles have dominated the games industry, with nearly all of them selling over 100 million units. Many of Sony's games are considered some of the best of all time, and their consoles have been the homes of some of the most beloved third-party franchises ever. However, for all the success they've had in the console market, they were never able to replicate it with their handhelds. Despite having a strong start, they faced way too many issues that hurt their chances, and within a decade, Sony would abandon the handheld market altogether. The failure of Sony's handhelds came as a surprise for many. In fact, the PSP did fairly well when it came out, being the most successful non-Nintendo handheld ever. Their handhelds were incredibly advanced for the time, providing a ton of multimedia functionalities while offering a gaming experience that rivaled their flagship consoles. Unfortunately, Sony was never able to support the PSP properly, and their mismanagement would go on to plague its successor. What exactly happened to cause Sony's handhelds to fail? Was there anything Sony could have done to keep themselves in the game? Let's go back to the beginning and retell the most famous origin story in gaming. It's the early 90s, and we witness one of the biggest power couples come into being. We have Nintendo, the biggest video game company in the world, partnering with Sony, the biggest electronics company in the world, to make the sound chip for the Super Nintendo. Its sound capabilities far exceeded its competitors, and it helped push Nintendo to be market leaders once again. This collaboration worked so well that both Sony and Nintendo wanted to deepen their relationship. Being the inventor of CDs, Sony suggested making a CD drive add-on for the Super Nintendo. At the same time, Sony would make their own console that combined the two platforms together, which they called PlayStation. Nintendo initially agreed to the proposal, but after reading the fine print and seeing how Sony would get all the profits for this new platform, Nintendo started having second thoughts. But Sony was still committed, and at CES 1991, they announced their new partnership with Nintendo to the world. However, the next day, Nintendo shocked everyone as they revealed they were cheating on Sony with Philips this entire time. Enraged at this betrayal, Sony started plotting their revenge. They initially wanted to partner with Sega to make a new console, but after getting dumped by them, Sony decided to make a console on their own. Thanks to the engineering prowess of the man at Sony who worked closely with Nintendo, Ken Kudaragi, Sony was able to create a top-of-the-line game console that displayed 3D graphics and played CDs. They enticed third-party developers with the powerful hardware as well as favorable licensing deals thanks to the cheap manufacturing of CDs. They were even able to undercut their competitors in price thanks to their experience with CD development. Although many had their doubts, Sony was ready to declare war on the gaming giants, and within a few years, they were victorious! The PlayStation became the best-selling game console of all time, a record that would only be beaten by its successor. The PlayStation brand would be synonymous with gaming for an entire generation, and their competitors didn't even come close in matching their success. Sega was completely annihilated, and Nintendo was holding on for dear life. But Sony was out for blood! They wanted to finish Nintendo off once and for all, and they would do this by competing in the last sector Nintendo still dominated, handheld gaming. Even as their console business deteriorated, Nintendo's handheld business was still going strong. Many have tried to compete with Nintendo over the years, but all of them failed to make a dent in the Game Boy. But then again, what even could? But Sony was no slouch when it comes to handheld devices. They made the Walkman after all. So it should be a cinch for them to make their own handheld game console. In fact, they went above and beyond what anyone thought was possible. While Nintendo conservatively specs their handhelds to keep prices down, Sony went all out with theirs, to the point where its power even rivaled their home console. Not only that, but they also made their handheld an all-in-one device with video playback, an MP3 player, and even a web browser. When Sony officially revealed the PlayStation Portable at E3 2004, everyone was amazed! The system blew away everything that came before it, and it wasn't even close! At the same time, Nintendo revealed the DS, which looked pathetic in comparison. It was essentially a portable PS1 with this weird two-screen gimmick, while Sony jumped over them by an entire generation. They really thought people would be excited to play Super Mario 64 on the go with no analog stick? Screw that! Give me Ridge Racer any day of the week! Ridge Racer! Remember that one? Alright, so let me, uh, let me go right ahead. The PSP blew everyone away, and it was the talk of the show, while Nintendo faced ridicule with their DS. In fact, 
Nintendo struggled to sell the DS at the beginning, and it was prime time for Sony to steal the handheld crown right from under them. When the PSP finally launched, Sony looked like they were going to win, and oh wait, what's this? It looked like Nintendo had an ace up their sleeve this entire time. People were initially confused by the two screens of the DS, but Nintendo proved its worth by providing a variety of software that makes great use of the feature. Alongside heavy hitters like Mario Kart DS, New Super Mario Bros., and, of course, Pokemon, Nintendo implemented their Blue Ocean strategy, making games aimed more towards non-gamers. They helped old people prevent Alzheimer's with Brain Age, they had plenty of puzzle titles like Cross and Sudoku, and they even had puppies with Nintendogs. Thanks to these games, Nintendo expanded their handheld business to a new market, and they would dominate the sales charts because of it. By the end of the generation, the DS would become the best-selling handheld of all time, leaving the PSP in the dust. So Sony failed to knock Nintendo out of the game, but it didn't matter. The PSP was still a big hit in its own right. Everyone loved playing console-quality games on the go, and the system had a great library of exclusives, ranging from 2D games, quirky titles, and a surprising amount of decent racing games. The console was also a massive hit in Japan thanks to the popularity of the Monster Hunter franchise. More on that later. But as much as people loved the PSP, it still had a ton of problems underneath. First, let's talk about the overall concept. Sony pushed the PSP as bringing a console-like experience on the go, and while it had the power to match those claims, it was still lacking in other areas, particularly the controls. The PSP only had six action buttons, a D-pad, and one analog stick, which made it feel more like a portable Dreamcast than a portable PS2. Unfortunately, this limited control scheme made some console ports more difficult to play. Take Ape Escape on the loose, for example. The original Ape Escape was a technical showpiece for dual analog controls, but when it was ported to the PSP, it lost a lot of what made the game fun in the translation. Thanks to the lack of a second analog stick, some gadgets were a pain to use, where they were either simplified with button controls, or made even more painful where you had to use the D-pad and analog stick in tandem, making it impossible to move and use your gadget at the same time. This was a problem faced with many games, particularly 3D titles that relied on the second analog stick for camera controls. To compensate, they either had to use the bumper buttons or face buttons to move the camera, which is not very intuitive for most games. Unfortunately, it was the best developers could do, and a lot of games suffered because of this. Although people initially found the concept of playing console quality games on the go appealing, the game controls made it difficult for people to enjoy them, and many wished they were playing these games on the console with a full controller instead. But even when certain PSP games were eventually ported to consoles, many complained they weren't as good as their console contemporaries. While it's expected that handheld versions of games wouldn't match the quality of console games, since Sony pushed the PSP as a portable PS2, many of its games were held to the PS2's standards. And unfortunately, many of these games ended up missing the mark. Outside of control problems, the main issue was that many of these games weren't up to par in terms of content or quality. This was mainly because most developers outsourced their PSP games to B-tier developers who didn't quite understand how to work with the franchises they were given. Sony was especially notorious for this. While certain games still ended up alright, many others suffered due to the lack of experience with working on these franchises. They generally lacked the features, and more importantly, the budgets needed to make a game on par with the console version. Maybe if Sony gave these games the attention they needed, or maybe if they had their A-tier devs like Naughty Dog or Santa Monica make games for the PSP, things might have ended up different. Unfortunately, Sony was more interested in saving their failing PS3 console than they were in giving the PSP the support it needed, but they did support the PSP in one big way, advertising. But looking back, maybe they could have done better on that front. But then again, Sony's advertising was awful for everything around the latter half of the 2000s. Remember the screaming baby? <laughs> Okay, Jesus Christ, I don't know what's going on here. But for the PSP, they had some of the most asinine commercials I've ever seen. Initially, they showed people having fun outside, playing games to Franz Ferdinand. But eventually, the commercials got weird. And also racist. Mostly, they involve a bunch of cartoon characters talking back and forth, having random guys fighting over the console. And I remember one set in particular that I just can't seem to find anywhere on the internet. They had these thumb puppets recreating Romeo and Juliet, where Juliet is going, Romeo, oh, Romeo, where are thou, Romeo? And then when he doesn't come out, she screams, Romeo! And then Romeo comes out talking about the PSP. If you remember what I'm talking about, and I'm not just having a fever dream, let me know in the comments, or link to a video if you actually find it. 
Keep in mind that this was the golden age of Spike TV and hypermasculinity. So many marketing agencies back then were big into this trend, even though it's insufferable to look back on now. However, even to this day, most people still hate these miserable rodents. But there's portable nut! What? Yeah! It's a nut you can play with outside! Larry, what the f*** is this shit? But that wasn't even the worst commercial. Back in 2006, Sony decided to experiment with viral advertising, and they decided to release this gem to the world. PSP, 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 PSP. So yeah, the PSP's advertising was pretty terrible, but it still sold, so I guess it worked. But even with these shortcomings, many still loved the PSP and all the great games it provided, but many devs were complaining their games weren't selling, and eventually they stopped making games for the system altogether. Even with all of its flaws, there was one issue that trumped everything else, and it was the main reason for the downfall of the PSP. Piracy. Piracy was rampant on the PSP. Thanks to the mini USB port, people were able to connect the system to their PCs and put whatever they wanted on them. Eventually, someone figured out how to download custom firmware, and many used this opportunity to download as many games, homebrew, and emulators as their heart desired. Granted, piracy was also a problem on the DS, but that required buying an R4 card to use. And also, since the DS's user base tended to be younger, or in some cases older, DS game sales weren't affected nearly as much. With the PSP's teenage and young adult audience, many of them figured out how to download the custom firmware and where to download all the newest games that were easily ripped within the first day of the game coming out. Although software sales started off strong, they would quickly die out due to piracy, and eventually the PSP would end up having the worst software attach rate of any Sony console. Sony scrambled to find a solution to their piracy problem. Their main attempt was to focus more heavily on their online connectivity by bringing over their PlayStation network to the PSP. Maybe people won't hack their consoles that they don't want their PSN accounts banned. Users trade their ability to hack by gaining access to the PlayStation Store, which gave them the ability to purchase games directly through the internet. Sony initially provided many titles through the service, but eventually they expanded the store to add retail games. Sony thought the PlayStation Store would be a big hit, to the point where they made a revision of the PSP that was digital only. In 2009, Sony released the PSP Go, to the bewilderment of basically everyone. To be fair, it did provide some cool features. It came in a sleek slide-out design. It came with 16 gigabytes of internal storage. And it even came with a dock that allowed you to play PSP games on the TV, much like a prototypical Switch. The only problem was the handheld cost $250, which was just insane for what you were getting. You could buy a PSP 3000 for much less money, and be able to download games through that. Plus, you still have access to the UMD drive, which gave you access to the PSP's full catalog when some games, including some newer titles, weren't available to purchase through the PlayStation Store. As you can tell, the PSP Go didn't do very well, but it still has its fans. Maybe you did want to go digital only by this point, and didn't want to deal with the slow UMD drive, but with the PlayStation Store for the PSP shutting down in 2021, these things are now effectively paperweights. That is, of course, unless you pirate games! Your heart being a pirate is a thing. Do what you want, cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate. But eventually, PSP hardware sales started to decline. Smartphones were quickly gaining popularity, and thanks to their vast selection of cheap or even free games, most people realized they didn't need a dedicated handheld system anymore. They were content with playing the small games for 15 minutes at a time while they're waiting for the bus or something. While Nintendo would try to fight against this trend, Sony decided to roll with the punches. If you can't beat them, join them! In 2011, Sony released the Xperia Play, one of the first dedicated gaming smartphones. It was an Android phone with a slide-out gamepad, similar to the PSP Go, but this time it includes dual analog touchpads. Alongside your standard Android games, Sony planned to launch a dedicated PlayStation mobile store where you can download certain PSP ports as well as PS1 games. However, the mobile market was too packed for Sony to make a dent in, so they ended up canceling their plans. You'd think this would make these phones worthless now, but keep in mind it's an Android phone. So, piracy! Your heart being a pirate is a red to be. Do what you want cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate. Even with their new phone releasing, Sony wasn't giving up on dedicated handheld gaming just yet. In January 2011, Sony officially revealed the true successor to the PSP, 
codenamed NGP, and they blew everyone's minds once again. The thing was essentially a portable PS3! Not only that, but it had a crisp 5-inch OLED display, 3G support to play games online anywhere, flashcards that loaded way faster than those lousy UMDs, and best of all, it has a second analog stick! Once again, Sony proved their dominance when it comes to hardware design, and this time, they wanted to be as competitive with Nintendo as possible. At E3, Sony fully revealed their new handheld, now titled PlayStation Vita, showing off an incredible library of original titles and console ports with an MSRP of $250, the same price as the 3DS at the time. In terms of value, the Vita blew the 3DS out of the water. For $250, Nintendo was selling what was essentially a PSP in a DS's body with a 3D screen. 3D might have been a huge gimmick at the time, but their glassesless technology didn't really work unless you were looking at the screen at just the right angle. Worse still, there were barely any worthwhile games for the system. Nintendo held off on releasing big hitters for the 3DS to give third parties their time to shine, but once again, third parties didn't deliver, and the only worthwhile game for the system was yet another port of Ocarina of Time. It looked like history was repeating itself, except this time, Nintendo didn't have the casuals to save them as they have all moved on to smartphones. Even in the shrinking market, it looked like Sony was finally going to beat Nintendo once and for all. By the end of the year, Sony released the Vita in Japan and it launched in the rest of the world in early 2012. Once again, everyone was impressed with the hardware and games, but this time, the system wasn't selling. How could that be? The Vita was incredible! Have you seen these graphics? Why was nobody interested? Well, it could be that nobody knew the Vita was even out, as Sony barely advertised the thing. There were a few ads that appeared on TV for a few months, but they barely appeared anywhere. Even during their press conferences, Sony barely mentioned the Vita. If you're lucky, they'll announce a couple games, but everything else was just focused on the PS3 and eventually the PS4. Maybe Sony was too intimidated by smartphones to give the Vita a proper push, or maybe it's because the Vita is way too similar to the PSP, in both concept and with all the same flaws. First, the control problems were still there. Although it's cool that they finally added a second analog stick, they were still missing critical buttons that would make console ports more playable. Sony's solution for this was to implement the most useless gimmick for any console I've ever seen, the rear touchpad. My hands are cramping just looking at that thing. Second, the software support was still lackluster, especially coming from Sony. Although the Vita had some decent launch titles and had a bunch of great titles come out for the rest of the year, there were still plenty of duds released as well, many of which were fairly high profile. We saw Zipper Interactive release Unit 13, a mediocre third-person shooter from the studio behind the SOCOM games. It did so badly that Sony shut down the studio less than a month later. We saw the Final Resistance game release with Burning Skies, one of two shooters released on the Vita by Nihilistic Studios. Once again, it was a mediocre shooter that's a shell of the console version, but it didn't matter, as Nihilistic had another shooter on the horizon, which Sony hoped would be the killer app needed for the Vita to take off. Call of Duty Black Ops Declassified. As you expect, it's another Call of Duty, but it had a campaign that could be completed in less than an hour, a fairly limited multiplayer mode with only seven tiny maps, and it could all be yours for $50! What a steal! It's no surprise that Nihilistic shut down after this game came out. Once again, Sony was dropping the ball when it came to supporting their handhelds. Sony was having their B-tier studios make games with their handhelds, and they continued to release B-tier games nobody cares about. It might have been okay during the PSP days, but now that you're comparing the Vita to the HD consoles, these types of experiences were unacceptable, especially when you're charging console level prices for these games. And again, this gave the impression that the Vita was like playing on a console, but worse. And I feel this was the death knell for the Vita. If you were paying so much for games, why not play them in the best way possible by playing it on a console? Even if some of these ports were on par with their console counterparts, was it really worth paying $250 for the handheld $50 for the game, and then a bunch more money on a memory card just for the privilege of playing on the go? Oh yeah, I haven't even talked about the memory cards yet! For the hardware the Vita was packing, $250 seemed too good to be true, and that's because it was! As a hidden cost, Sony forced Vita owners to purchase a proprietary memory card they wanted to save their games. If you were short on cash after spending so much on the handheld, you could get a 4GB card for $20, which isn't much, but you could at least save your games. If you're looking to buy games digitally, then you would most likely want to get a 32GB card, 
which could be yours for a whopping $100. You could get a 32 gigabyte SD card for a fraction of the price at the time. What was Sony thinking forcing people to buy these things? Do they have to use proprietary tech for everything? Even if you went the cheaper route and only bought the smaller cards, they're so tiny that you'll most likely lose one if you constantly switch them out. High cost of the handheld, the games, and the memory cards, the Vita turned out to be more costly than people were anticipating. Although it had some decent titles, many felt they were better off playing them on a console, and many stuck with smartphones to get their handheld gaming needs. Or you know, there was still Nintendo. Even though the 3DS struggled during its launch period, Nintendo quickly went into panic mode and did a course correction for their handheld. They lowered the price of the 3DS by 40% worldwide, got a bunch of big titles ready for the holiday season, and they even made a big announcement for Japan. All Monster Hunter games will be coming exclusively for the 3DS. This was perhaps the biggest death knell for Sony. Monster Hunter is huge in Japan, and was the reason why the PSP did so well over there. With that gone, Sony didn't have any big exclusive franchise for their handheld. They would try to release their own Monster Hunter clones, but none of them took off. Now that Nintendo had Monster Hunter alongside Pokemon and Yokai Watch, Nintendo was an unstoppable force in Japan, where the 3DS would become one of the best-selling systems of all time over there. Even worldwide, despite growing competition from smartphones, Nintendo still held their own with the 3DS. Despite the line between console and handheld gaming blurring, Nintendo released games that helped justify the 3DS and its features, which is more than they did with the Wii U. Titles such as The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds, Fire Emblem Awakening, Animal Crossing New Leaf, and of course, Pokemon, all kept the system in the public eye. Unlike the Vita, the 3DS turned out to be a cost-effective way of experiencing Nintendo games, especially if you bought a 2DS for less than $100 at points. And hey, at least Nintendo had the common sense to allow you to use SD cards, and it even came with one in the box. Sure, smartphones still did a dent to Nintendo's handheld business, and the 3DS still sold half of what the DS did, but the 3DS still managed to carry Nintendo through their trouble period. As for Sony, the Vita became an afterthought. Before completely giving up, Sony tried one more thing by selling the Vita as a complementary system for their consoles. They introduced cross-buy for certain games, which gave you a free Vita copy of a game when you bought it on their consoles. For Sony, the only major titles they did this for was Sly 4 and PlayStation All-Stars, and I don't see many people rushing to buy a Vita for those games. In 2013, Sony released a redesign for the Vita, which was made cheaper by using an LCD screen instead of OLED, and they added a whopping 1 gigabyte of storage, just so people could stop complaining about memory card prices if they just wanted to save their games. When the PS4 came out, Sony pitched the Vita as a handheld device that could be used to stream your PS4 games from anywhere. It didn't work very well, especially considering you were forced to use the god-awful rear touchpad to play most games, but it was a nice thought. However, Sony thought it was such a great idea that they made a consoleized version of the Vita just for that purpose. In 2013, Sony released the PlayStation TV. It was a streaming box that had no streaming apps. Yeah, the PlayStation TV was pretty much useless. It could play Vita games, and it even had a port for physical cartridges, but only about half of the system's library was supported, which was mostly chosen arbitrarily. It was nice to play some PSP and PS1 games on the TV though, but its main feature was to stream PS4 games from another room in your house. Once again, the streaming tech didn't work well, so yeah, this thing is pretty useless. But there was one way to make it better, and that is... Say it with me, folks! Piracy! Your heart in a ditty, being a pirate is a red to Do what you want, cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate! Within a few years, the small but dedicated Vita community found a way to install custom firmware and pirate as much as they wanted. They did implement some cool features, such as being able to use SD cards to store digital downloads, and it'll also be able to play any Vita game on the PlayStation TV if it didn't need the handheld-specific features to function properly, but mostly it was used to install homebrew, emulators, and of course, pirated games. Sony tried their best to support the Vita, as in they did nothing and ran out of ideas, but unfortunately they eventually gave up. Sony would stop making games with the console by 2014. They would stop mentioning the Vita entirely at their press conferences, and eventually they would pull all support for the system by 2015, following up with an announcement that they had no plans to release another handheld. In the end, the Vita only sold slightly better than the Wii U, but for those that did own one at the time, they all loved it. Similar to the Wii U, the PlayStation Vita was the other console that held me through my college days, 
I was enamored with all the different console ports available to me. Playing through a bunch of Luminez, Rayman, and Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, all thanks to PlayStation Plus. But where the Vita really shone was from the support of the indie game community. I swear, the Vita was the perfect indie machine. Thanks to the many indie games supporting Crossbuy, you had a vast library of games to play with if you also owned a PlayStation console. I spent so many hours playing through a bunch of titles like Luftrausers, TXK, and Ali Ali World, and I enjoyed playing these games more on the Vita than I did on the PC. These were the type of games that work best on a handheld. They're easy to pick up and addicting to play. You can play them for as little as 10 minutes or for as long as you want. Indie developers understood what worked best on the Vita, and it was no surprise that most Vita owners enjoyed their games the most. Even if they didn't use the Vita to its full potential, the OLED screen and comfortable form factor made these games a joy to play. Throw in a bunch of PSP and PS1 games in the mix, and you have yourself an incredible handheld experience, one that I even enjoyed more than the 3DS. Even today, the PlayStation Vita is an incredible piece of tech. Even if it's low res by today's standards, the OLED screen is still beautiful to look at. It's one of the most ergonomic handhelds I've ever used with smooth buttons and an incredible D-pad. Sure, the analog sticks are a little too small and the rear touchpad is still dumb, but for most of the games I played on the Vita, it didn't really bother me much. Especially if you had PlayStation Plus, the Vita was a great way to play through a bunch of old and new titles, a wide variety of indie titles, and there were even some good retail titles here and there. But even though I love the Vita, I can't help but see how it's been surpassed over the years. The Nintendo Switch is everything the Vita should have been. It might be a bit large and the Joy-Cons are still lousy, but from a conceptual level, the Switch is a much more appealing device, even without the OLED screen. Oh wait! Unlike the Vita, you can connect the Switch to a TV with a dock, which gives people flexibility in how they want to play their games. The games themselves are full-fledged console games from both Nintendo and third parties, and they're playable in both console and handheld modes without any compromises. It's important to note how Nintendo has given their full support to the Switch. It's the only platform they've supported since 2019, and it has brought them a ton of success because of this. And I guess that's what Sony was looking to do. They saw the Vita as dead weight early on and decided to drop it immediately. They were finally able to turn the PS3 around and they wanted to carry that success over to the PS4, but then again, who wouldn't after seeing how badly the competition was doing? As much as I love the Vita, it makes sense as to why Sony dropped it. The truth is, in the modern era, it's incredibly difficult to support two different platforms at once. Nintendo struggled with it for decades, and then you look at Sega. They thought they could support seven platforms at once, and look how that turned out. Especially as handheld gaming was getting closer to console gaming, it didn't make sense to keep a separate handheld system available. The budgets and scales of these games were starting to match their console counterparts. Most people saw that it didn't make sense to play these inferior versions on a handheld when you can enjoy a better version on a console, until Nintendo merged the two together and now they're one and the same. Despite dedicated handheld systems essentially disappearing, the concept of handheld gaming hasn't died, it just changed. For Sony, they're more focused on bringing their console games on the go via their cloud service, and since they started bringing their games to the PC, you can now play PlayStation games on the Steam Deck. Hell, they even started making games for the Switch. In the end, Sony realized that they were better suited at making consoles and stuck with what they knew best, much like how Nintendo realized they were better suited at making handhelds and adjusted accordingly. Because of their decisions, both companies are more successful than they've ever been, and they're happy they're not directly competing with each other anymore. It looks like all the bad blood is behind them, and now they can focus on making the best games possible. But it's interesting to look back and see how things could have been. Had Sony properly supported their handhelds as much as Nintendo does, maybe they might have had a chance. The Switch proves that there's a space for dedicated handhelds, and many others are jumping on the bandwagon. Maybe one day Sony will change their minds and make another handheld that will blow our minds. But with the industry pushing heavily towards cloud gaming, I don't see that happening. At least we still have these two great handhelds to play. But then again, let's be honest, the DS is the greatest handheld of all time. OF ALL TIME!